I just noticed no action items. Um, yeah, no, none that I can see either, John. Maybe uh, we can give an update on the working group stuff. Most people <laughs> are there, but. Hey, Josh. If, are you able to give the update? I'm just uh, dropping my kids to school, so it's I'm yeah, not in a I, quiet place to give that. So I'm happy for you yeah, to give an update if there's nothing else. I got Sajay and Brandon here too, so we can, yeah. Yeah, if you could lead that, I'm okay with that. Thanks. Sure. All right, um, I guess uh, here, so there's no agenda this week. So we talked about a minute ago, talking about what's going on with the reference group, uh, the, the reference types working group. And I will uh, post the notes to this. Um, if you wanna see the full picture, um, but we met on, uh, what day was it? Um, the other day and we we're trying Tuesday, to get together. The Tuesday, thank you. Um, yeah. trying to get together, uh, the mission statement that Lockie is put a PR against, uh, in GitHub. And there was a little bit of discussion about that. Um, I think though the general idea was to simplify and distill what it is that we're trying to achieve there. Um, and then for the next steps, um, I'm seeing something about garbage collection in here. I, I was a little lost on that. If someone wants to talk about that a bit. I think the, the agreed next steps were distilling the proposals uh, into a set of requirements and then getting agreement on the requirements. Um, and then, sorry, I, I live at the top of a very big hill. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm puffed. The other one was you were going to pull out, uh, create a straw person example that we could use. Um, you know, the ice cream example. Right. To, uh, to build all the work against. Yeah, and uh, to elaborate on that last piece, basically my point was so that we don't get bogged down in the specifics of um, the tooling and projects that each of us and our companies are trying to uh, promote, that perhaps we could do something uh, friendly like that would have parallels with SBOMs and signatures and other types of things that we might want to uh, link together in a registry. And if you check out the, there's a new channel in Slack, WG reference types, um, where there's a discussion on this. I brought up ice cream, Vanessa talked about cookies. Um, I, 
I don't know if, if at this point it's getting more distracting than than that, but that's pretty much it. So that that meeting is Tuesdays um, at eleven Pacific. All I know is you're making me hungry now. It's the risk of talking about food. Thanks for providing that else? update, Josh. Of course. Did anyone have any uh, anything OCI general to discuss before we call it early? There was a comment about um, doing some PR pruning. Was there interest in doing that, or do we just not have the right people here for that? Um, I see John, I see Tianan, I see Samuel. Um, what, what specifically, was there something specifically? I see Mike. I, I didn't have any on my list, but, uh, that was Amy's suggestion. Um, I, I'd be happy to, to share screen and do some of that. Is there... Did anybody have any issues that they had proposed or wanted to look at specifically? I didn't put the extensions PR on the agenda because Vincent wasn't able to make the call also. So but we can take the take a look at that next week. Besides that, I don't have anything. Okay. And for your stuff, Sajay, are you looking to get that merged right now as is and then we work off of that or is that blocking anything from your side? Uh, no, I mean, I think merged as is kind of where uh, some points were added by uh, Steve last week. Uh, he had summarized the issue. So if Vincent is making those changes, we can merge it. Or um, I think it's better. I mean, my personal opinion would be like that Vincent say it's a, in good shape to merge or not, right? Like it's just bad, so. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, if people don't have their own, I was just going to start making new PR for you guys to worry about later on. Um, okay, I'm, I'm in favor of dropping and waiting until we have uh, Steve-O and Vince to talk this uh, specifically, but... All right. Sounds good. Happy, Put it on the agenda for this week. Make a little progress. Perfect. We have an agenda. Perfect. All right. I know it's. I know it's going to be a dependency on on what what you guys didn't do in the reference. So. All right. Cheers. Sir. Till next right. week. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think we still have enough quorum, John, for that proposal you sent me privately? Uh, depends on the quorum. Remember, this is recorded here. The proposal yeah. was to turn this into a Bo Burnham fan club. Are you going to play music? I, my, I don't think I can for copyright reasons. Get the OCI calls DMCA struck. That would be outrageous. Yeah. Oops. That's an interesting idea for terrorizing open source groups. <laughs> well, that one's on the record. <laughs> and here to here. It was Tianon's idea. Yep. So, this is a Bo Burnham Pam Club now. We got to somehow backronym OCI into Bo Burnham. I don't see it. Boci. <laughs> Open containers. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Doesn't he have a joke about drinking? Almost certainly. Can you be a comedian without at least one joke about drinking? 
not for long. Well, now we've stayed on too long. Sorry, guys, the call's already oh. over. Oh, round two. <laughs> did I did I just barely catch it? Well, it, it already ended. We just haven't hung up yet. Oh. Yeah. I was just well, lying my tea. Hi, Steven. How you doing? Oh, I saw Terrible. stuff happening on the on the notes. Okay. What what were the hot topics? Did we did we get um the uh what is it the extensions thing like like did we get that worked out? Or are we still kind of? I think we realized that? quorum of maintainers, so no decisions could be made about anything, and so. Everyone dropped. Sorry. Man, it seems like there's some decent, decent representation here. Let's see which one was it? But I was also five minutes late, so I may have missed some other discussions. Wait, is it merged? I don't think so. Oh, it's on distribution. Okay, it's still there. I was wondering if there's further discussion. I think the discussion was mostly we wanted you and VBAT to around to talk about it if we were going to talk about it. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, it looks like people like module over operation. That's that's good. <laughs> I love those solid semantic decisions that really move projects forward. Um, OK. Need widgets. Widgets, things, and things. Um, all right, well, good to see you. Is that Sam and Mike and Tian? <laughs> all right, well, I guess I'll hop off then, or do you guys have any questions or anything like that? Does anybody know what's going on with protobuf these days? Uh, abstractly? In the, Go, in the Go community? Is, is that a leading question, or are you? No, I'm just curious. Like, is there like, because there, I noticed there's like a few features. There's like a new feature called um, source relative in there. Um, well, like GoGo -Go went away, right? And then I guess this is like completely irrelevant for OCI, but like GoGo -Go has pretty much gone away. And then we're kind of we, like, there's a lot of usage of GoGo -Go across the community. Um, but now there's this new thing called source relative in the paths that kind of helps generate things. I don't know if, if any of you are like following those developments. I kind of straddle two universes of protobuf and so it's hard for me to even got it what's real and what's internal i suspect it's easier internally sometimes harder sometimes harder interesting okay. i don't know anything about source relative something it's um so the the hardest part about getting protobuf generation to work out of with modules was that you had to kind of use the go path to set the output path to like get it to go next to your files. Mm -hmm. So all source relative does is get rid of that so that when you're when you set your output, it'll go uh, next to the protobuf file, which is kind of what you want. Um, and uh, they um, so that fixes a lot of problems with the generation. Just wondering if anybody knew anything about that. That's a whole nother world. I, I was looking at this for continuity. Um, I think you're alone and uh, caring. Oh, oh man. That's either a good thing or a bad thing. Living on the edge. Yeah, nobody knows. Any other cool OCI stuff? No. Not to my knowledge. 
We have the reference types working group. Oh, how's that going? It's nice. Yeah. I think. I think that we may have decided on the purpose of the group. That's a and tough two meetings. That's a tough uh, meeting time for me to make. Yeah. I might join you though. I'll join you sometime. Finalize the mission statement. Oh, cool. Describe and query relationships. Does this mean we're getting a GraphQL endpoint? <laughs> uh, I don't really want to implement a GraphQL. I know it's it's a it's. I love the idea. It's really hard to implement, though. I don't know if that's even something I can do. GraphQL? I mean, maybe. I guess you can always do it yourself. I'm not aware of any Google stuff that does GraphQL. A nice group of people we have here. I wish we had a task to complete. I feel like we'd really succeed. Quick Google search found. Oh, so we want to talk GraphQL now. Okay. I mean, so that's not a terrible idea, right? Like, the alternative is to have like pseudo RESTful. The API we make up that is going to be inefficient for somebody. Yeah. I mean, I think it's worth exploring. Um, the uh, maybe I should show up to the uh, to that group and do it and at least say, hey, are we interested in this? At like looking at it as a as a possibility, and hopefully I don't get tomatoes thrown at me. I think two years ago I would have thrown tomatoes at you, but now I'm. I, I think you even did. I think I brought this up at some yeah, point. I'm pretty sure I, I was not happy because I don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> but uh... Dude, what's the rejoiner? Ooh, interesting. So the thing about okay, so the. I, I did a little work with GraphQL, and the reason I had chosen it for for a project that I'd worked on was that we had a bunch of like loosely related objects that had relationships that were kind of heterogeneous, but only interesting to certain w without overlapping use cases. So, like you'd have certain parties that have, would have relationships that were important to them like they would not share that use case with other people. So you could create a schema over that like object graph that would allow them to arbitrarily query it. But you can implement the different parts of the GraphQL so that those queries will be efficient. So you don't give them arbitrary like database access. So they're not like hammering your database with crazy queries. Like you're serving them with like a formed designed query, but at the same time they're able to like um, like say they need to add a new field or they uh, want to like join it with some other object or something like that and do that without your support, which is, which is good. But you're still having your query space is still limited to what you targeted with the performance of your application. I, like I can imagine mapping certain GraphQL queries onto like an efficient query that's kind of hand rolled. I don't know how you would do this in a way that's like 
I can service any query efficiently or at all. Like, no, I, I don't know how to do this in an efficient way. You know? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying you kind of know the queries that are going to come in. You know the relationships that are going to get queried uh, up front. And so you don't need to serve arbitrary queries. Does that make sense? Uh, not really. Do we have, like... If we expose a GraphQL interface, wouldn't that mean I have to support arbitrary queries, or do I just like return a not implemented if they do something that? Like yeah, well, you you can define you can define like methods and schema relationships that you can only you can define only the schema methods and relationships that you intend to support with that schema. I've I've not actually used GraphQL in my life, so am I, I'm I'm imagining like some analog to SQL where they can just query. No, oh no no no. No, it's. I, I thought that too. I was like, "Oh, sweet! Finally, we have like the SQL of graphs." It's. It is not that. There's another language. I. I don't remember the name. Of, the name of that language. Gremlin. But there's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well, Gremlin's the project. Is it? Is it GQL? Oh, I hope it's called GQL. But, um, the. Uh, no, it's not that. This is like more about. It's like a a view language would be. Kind of the way to put it. OK, so I could like, I you expose a public API that people are allowed to call. Yeah. Interesting. And then you send like queries to it, but the queries have to be within the schema that you're you're given for that particular endpoint. Yeah, re Rejoiner is an interesting project. But have I mean, for used... images, like, sorry, say it again. Have you used Rejoiner? No, I used, what was it, Graph, Gophers, something. It was Graph, Gophers, GraphQL, Go. Full disclosure, I've never seen Rejoiner before today. I, I literally just Googled that just to mess with John because Google's big. <laughs> GraphQL's <laughs> got to be used somewhere in Google. Yeah, yeah, right. And you found you found two instances. <laughs> yeah, right off the yeah. bat, first two results. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd looked at Rejoiner sometime because I was just like, oh, cool, they have a Java thing for it. It looks actually more advanced than what's available in, in the Go community. That was the only problem we had with GraphQL is the Go stuff was a little, like, kind of first generation. Um, but the JavaScript stuff is is impressive. Like you can give it like a database schema, and it'll like automatically generate a schema for you and you can, and it will serve arbitrary queries pretty much. Um, but the, the Go stuff, you end up writing these like resolver things and you can really control how you craft queries against your, your database backend um, and make it, easily kind of work across um, different data sources and whatnot. So um, it might be interesting, but I mean, like we might find with uh, with uh, registries, the uh, that, you know, the set of queries that you really want to have are, are pretty small, right? You might be able to define those relationships and give them proper names. Yeah, I mean, like, it feels to me that the most common queries are going to be like, "Tell me stuff that points to this." Um, yeah, and doing that to some depth seems reasonable. Uh, yeah. Anyways, maybe I'll pop by that call sometime. I'll add this to my ever-growing pile of things to look at. Yeah, that pile continued. Have you looked at Rust yet? <laughs> Insofar as it's on my pile. Yeah, it's on your pile, yeah. I think like Rust or Zig is the next thing I learned. Yeah, Zig looks promising. 
as well. I think they have a where I'm looking for a stylistic link to go a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I don't. It, it just looks very like pragmatic, like yeah, Z yeah. Like, Russ feels a little like dogmatic in a good way, I guess. And Zig is just like, ah, this makes sense. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we oh, we also have uh, go uh, generics to deal with too. I'm terrified. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to have to rethink how I <laughs> design things. Um, yeah, I think I think what we'll see is uh, a lot of new packages come May or whenever when 118 gets released. I anticipate a lot of V2 packages and then fast followed by a bunch of V3s once we realize we've done everything wrong. Yeah. 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 I, I think it'll take a little bit to figure out like, okay, am I making a mistake with this design? I, I, I played with it a little bit and um, you can definitely work yourself into a corner, but it, it's pretty powerful and it like, it does solve some problems I've had before. Um, the, uh, I, I, I hope it could do something about, uh, like Kubernetes client go, for example, um, like param the parameterization of, of interfaces would be great over types. Yeah, I think Jason was playing with this actually. Um, I hasn't touched it in a month, but um, an attempt to rewrite client go using generics. Yeah, it would make, because they have the dynamic client in there. And it, if you could have something like the dynamic client that is generic. I think that's exactly what it did. Just like parameterize yeah. the client. Yeah, that would be, um, that would fix like 90% of the problems and just the amount of code there um, would also go down. And then also it would um, reduce the code generation required for CRTs to probably just the types themselves. Yeah, that I think that was the biggest pain point for me when we were working on CRDs is like, there's so yeah. much code and there's, I just feel like fighting the language the entire time to make things a little bit ergonomic for callers. Yeah. It's like, ah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I have, I have a project that uses CRDs and I haven't updated it in a while. And I'm, I'm dreading that moment. There's usually because the with that code generation, usually there's some sort of internal dependency that you end up with as well that breaks. Um, at least that, that's what I saw on the Kubernetes stuff. Powerful enough to be good. It works, kind of. Yeah. I it remember, works, like, works works better than all the things we've tried. When we started, there was no story for like upgrading CRDs, uh, like up bumping versions. And by the time I stopped caring, uh, it still was in a bad state. I think, just like, how do we service these versions? We don't. Okay, cool. I guess. Like and the, and the, like, the set of rules you needed to follow to like be able to change a CRD to a new version without breaking stuff was totally incomprehensible to me. Yeah, I think that's, that's a typical problem. Yeah. Um, I think you just have to have, you just support them both. Well, the, the guidance is to have like your controllers reconcile a single version and have like conversion functions from the other versions to whatever you actually operate on. Yeah, yeah. Do that, does uh, that work? I, like I've never followed through all those rules and mostly I've found that type evolution, just adding fields as you need them has worked out. Yeah, I, I kind of gave up before I think it got to a good point. But like the, the way things are moving was like annotation based automatic conversion and I was like, eh. Too many annotations on these structs. Ooh, client go like, to. They couldn't support non 
standard like types. Like if you like wrapped a, a type, it, it couldn't auto generate the conversion stuff, and so it was kind of a mess. It's a, why I'm really reluctant when people are like, "We'll just version this." I'm like versioning's hard. This is not a solution. Ver a yeah, problem. versioning's yeah, versioning's not a solved problem. Um, I think you, I think there's some belief there is because they'll be like, "Oh, Semver, just use that," and, and everything works out. But the, there's a lot of like subjective things around it that require um, case specific mitigations. Eric client runtime dot object. Kind of like how Go has their big compatibility promise, but they still manage to make breaking changes every other release. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the tool <laughs> chain isn't under that or something. It's just... no, it's yeah, the tool chain and there's some like package behavior things. Like I know I know we've had some breakage because of the tar package and the JSON package. Other packages. Um, what was the tar breakage? Um, this was like around one thirteen, maybe one fourteen time frame. Um, there it changed. There was like a change in the way that it handled certain kinds of timestamp formats, and so it would basically um, layers that were generated on one version of Docker would um, would have a different hash when we like re we tarred it back up when it was generated. So it would like, and I think there, there might have been an interaction with um, the VBATS tar, what's that thing? The tar, um, the tar exploder one. Tar, tar, tar split, tar sum. Tar split, yeah, because like you would take a tar that you had on disk, read tar sum, and then like pull the files off disk with tar sum, and then you go and you'd expect to have that stable output because it was stable before. Oh, did you find it? Maybe. Um, and uh, then it would. Um, so that it would generate something that would actually hash different. Yeah, this was the like PAX and GNU stuff. And then when you like start looking at TAR, because everybody's like, oh yeah, TAR has been around forever. The format's got to be stable. There's actually like uh, three different formats of varying different adoptions and behaviors. Um, this is, yeah, I think this is the change that broke it. I, I came across some argument in image spec, I think, with Trevor King that was like, we need to define tar. And everyone was like, no, we don't. Tar is easy. And then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Trevor King tar. was right about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he got that one right. Nailed it. I mean, because, I mean, there's, there's. Yeah, I think this is the, this is definitely the one. And there's some discussion where we reported it and Joey helped us get through it. I think Derek was looking at this one. But yeah, anyways, yeah, the compatibility is hard. How do we replace tar? Um, I mean, we go with like an external manifest format, but I mean, continuity. Yeah, I mean, continuity could do it if we like put put a lot of effort into it. Um, I just I think it would take maybe like two years, three years to really stabilize all the edge cases like really get them all and like, cause they're, like you keep running into these decisions. Cause, cause when you do it, you run into these decisions where you're like, okay, is this important to the disposition of the content? And you also have to ask, is this important enough to the disposition of the content to break a hash if it changes, right? And every time you go, no, it's not important enough. But then there's a use case that relies on that. 
and then you add it back in, you cause churn in the, in the hashes. So now you have two things that would have hashed equal before are now different. And so you have to like each step you take, you have to make these decisions. Um, whereas like, you know, you can say if you just use tar, you know, you can, it looks fine until it breaks. Um, and it's mostly not breaking because the tool, the underlying tooling is stable. Um, One of these but, days yeah. I'm going to do like a survey of all the options we have for moving past GZIP to tarballs. And then I'm going to form opinions. <laughs> right now I don't have any opinions. I'm just terrified. The the other, I mean, there's ETAR GZ or whatever, that thing. Yeah. I think that, that quiets a lot of the, because that one indexes tar files effectively, or if I recall. Yeah. I yeah. about that. Yeah, star gz the yeah. i think the e part mostly is the reshuffling of like access order um, and also they went actually added it to container d i think star gz is very clever um i wish i had thought of it but is it metric. is it just adding an index to the end of the tar gz it uh it basically chunks the gzip tar into a concatenated series of gzip tars okay uh, yeah which clients interpret just fine um and then at the end depends a index uh yeah okay because we okay because we talked about things like this but we were always like oh how do you get a tar file that'll be valid to things that don't know about it but then yeah so this yeah this is pretty clever to actually make it work yeah i i was surprised that clients just read through this fine i guess because the gzip readers like expect i don't know i they just it works uh and so i'm happy with it the only problem with this i think is that like the index ends up in the file system oh it does okay because it is a, an entry yeah um But, like, how bad is that really? Um, not as bad as, I don't know, we try to avoid putting those kinds of metadata files into images um, for a long time, but it just because it would, uh, it, it would create the insecure situation where people might try to pull apart that metadata file before they like verify the hash to get some information about how to like unpack it or something like that. Yeah. So the what the solution to that was to add an annotation of the hash of the table of contents file into the manifest. Uh, and so you can just hash the index and make sure it matches whatever was in your manifest. Okay. And then the, that index is secured by the hash of the entire thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's clever. It's like the only reason I like it is it doesn't break existing clients. Uh, hard to beat that. Yeah, yeah. And they don't have to be marked with a new media type or anything like that, right? You just do it. Yep. Uh, the East RGZ folks like propose this to the image spec. I don't really know how to respond. Sorry, yeah. I mean, I guess I can just LGTM this. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's also like a lot of people involved in other efforts, and I don't think it's reasonable to just say like, yeah, that's fine. This is now part of OCI. But it is, I mean, it's good, I think. How does the pulling client resolve this though? That's what I don't quite understand. Um, so there's a like snapshotter that they've implemented that. Oh, okay. Like knows about it. 
Yeah, I think it looks for this annotation and it does a, a range request on the end of the layer. And um, there's also an annotation that describes like the size of the table of contents. And so, or maybe they wanted one, but you, you should be able to make a range request and get the entire table of contents. And then uh, from there, just lazily access stuff. So it, like each entry has the like which chunk it's in. Um, and so you can do another range request to just request that gzipped tarball chunk. OK, and we lose some, do we lose some uh, compression efficiency? Yeah, yeah, you would. You could do some cleverness maybe around like sorting by similarity to compress. Uh, sure, yeah. Chunk. I think it's most then, useful then, to sort by access time. Yeah, that ends up costing a bunch of uh, extra cycles when packing. Mm So ETAR GZ is incompatible with star TG, star GZ though? I think star GZ is, uh, it uses the star GZ format. I think the E star GZ bit it involves um, prioritizing files. Okay. I think, I, I honestly couldn't tell you all of the uh, differences, but that is my understanding. Oh, they say the footer structure is incompatible because it adds. Some GZIP stuff. So we probably need to add something in the distribution side to instruct clients on how to pull it if they encounter this. So I'm going to give this like a idea LGTM. And then um, we need to have all the maintainers read it in detail. Yeah, I'd like to have them maybe present this or something if we can find a time that works for people. Because it would be having this somewhere neutral and official means like I, it's easier to convince support to be landed on this stuff, but. Yeah, but if, it might be easier to have a separate tar GZ spec and then have uh, the annotation and distribution reference it and be like, yeah. hey, here's how to detect tar GZ layers and or tar GZ layers. And if you encounter them, here's what to do on the client. I don't understand what they're saying about extra fields in RFC 
I love these old RFCs. There's somebody at MIT maintaining the registry. Just send them an email. And they're still there. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Okay. I see. It has this these group the groupings of prioritized versus non-prioritized. Okay. All right. Well, I have to drop off. Um, so, but it was good to go through this stuff, y'all. Um. I don't know if we can reach out. I, I made a comment on the ETAR GZ one. Um, the, uh, might be good. I don't know if we can reach out to this person. I don't know who this person is. Let's see if they can present it. All right, later. <laughs> See you, Steve. This person no longer maintains GZIP at MIT. Art is dead. <laughs> oh, he's the author of Cheese Hip. That is how the world works. I don't know that it makes sense to break compatibility to add things for a registry that no longer is, exists, but you do you. Wait, why are we breaking compatibility? Um, the footer of e star GZ is not compatible with the footer of star GZ because it must contain these extra fields that indicate it's a star GZ footer or something. Yeah, but is anyone putting star GZ things in a registry? I thought people that were doing this were doing e-star GZ. Well, I've put star GZ things in a registry. Okay. Not, not that it is material to any decisions, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know of anyone that has a, a star GZ client thing the same way that the e star GZ snapshot exists for container D. Um, I mean, rather the CRFS like fuse client. Hmm. I don't know how incompatible these are. I mean, if it if it's just like a block, like fifty bytes of metadata, I might as well make them the same. I think. It 
has four extra bytes. Okay, I'm going to leave y'all. It's lovely having coffee shop. Enjoy your Thursdays. You too. Okay. Bye. Tianan, should we jump over to the movie bridge? Uh, yeah, I'm going to take a quick bio break. Okay. Well, I'll see you in seven minutes then. Okay, sounds good.